morning, everyone, and welcome to Bethel today. My name is Michelle. I live in Fergus Falls and worship at the Fergus campus. It's great to see you today and to be gathered to worship the Lord on this beautiful day He has given us. Before we worship, a few reminders about what's coming up today in the life of the church. Right after worship services today, you're invited to the quarterly business meeting that starts at noon. Join us for this meeting to connect as a church family, celebrate what God has been doing, and hear where He is leading us as a church. Also after worship, it's car wash season, and the Bethel youth are here to help you with that. Every two years, the Church of the Lutheran Brethren hosts the Elevate Youth Convention, and we have 26 students from our Bethel youth who are raising money to travel to Colorado to attend. So before you leave church today, drive through the parking lot in Fergus Falls and get in line to help our students and get your car cleaned. If you're coming from Battle Lake for the business meeting, head outside after the meeting and get your car washed then. They will be outside and ready to serve until 3.30 today. And tonight is another opportunity. Bethel's Marriage Ministry is holding a dessert gathering for those who may be interested in being a marriage mentor. Marriage mentors walk alongside others that are preparing for marriage or maybe want to strengthen their relationship with their spouse. Your only commitment in coming tonight is to just listen and ask questions. Mentors are trained in a valuable process, and tonight you'll hear from those who have been walking people through this process and how rewarding ministry can be. This gathering is tonight at 6.30 p.m. and it's at my house, so I can promise our time will be well spent and the dessert will be awesome. So stop by the Connection Center today for more information. Hope to see you tonight. And finally, a reminder that there are two opportunities coming up to be the hands and feet of Jesus to others. The Bethel Disaster Relief Team is going to Nashville, Tennessee to rebuild after a recent tornado. They leave on June 2nd. And our Mexico mission trip is headed out again the first week of October. Join this team as they go to serve alongside our Mexico church partners, doing some local outreach and serving the Agua Viva ministry. Visit the Connection Center for more information about both of these upcoming trips. God's Word says in Matthew 7 to ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Friends, God invites us now to seek Him. As we worship Him and open His Word together, may you know His great love for you today. Receive His mercy and forgiveness provided freely through Jesus Christ. Let's worship Him now together. Hey everyone, Pastor Dave Foss here. Thanks for connecting with us today at Bethel. It's my prayer that this message be something that God uses in your life in conjunction with you belonging to a local church. We believe that online messages can help fill the gap when worship in your local church just isn't possible on a given weekend. Maybe you're traveling, maybe you got some health stuff going on, whatever the reason, isn't it great that we can connect like this? It is, and we're happy to share this online resource with you to encourage you till you can meet back here with us at Bethel or wherever your faith family is gathering. So again, thanks for connecting with us today and hope to see you soon. Well, good morning, Bethel Church. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. Those of you joining us in Bethel Battle Lake, good morning to you. Those of you online, hello. Glad you're here with us this morning. All right, well, let's dive in today, uh, and I want to start by, by calling out something that you may or may not know. Uh, I want you to know that, that uh, though for years, John 3.16 has been sort of the big dog, the top of the heap, the king of the hill, the, the goat of all goats, the greatest of all time verses, John 3.16. John 3.16 has been taken over. John 3.16 is no longer at the top of the heap. There is a new sheriff in town. Have you heard this? Yes, there's a new sheriff in town. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 is the new John 3.16 in our culture today. Um, it is the Bible verse that all of America has memorized. 
It is the Bible verse that all of America has committed themselves to and to which they have committed everybody else. We all need to be committed to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. It's absolutely incredible how America has come completely together around this one verse of Scripture. The new John 3.16 is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and it reads like this. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Man, do we love this verse. This verse is like the most often quoted verse in all of scripture now. It's just incredible. It shows up in situations like this. Here's how it sounds. Don't judge me. Don't judge me by my past. I don't live there anymore. (laughs) Don't judge me by the chapter that you walked in on. You haven't read the whole book. Sassy, right? Just sassy. I love it. Uh, Here's one. Before you judge me, make sure you're perfect. Spoiler alert, you're not, right? Or this one. You don't know what battles I fought, so don't judge me on the war you see. Oh, man. One more. Before you judge me, walk a mile in my shoes, then you can talk, but by then I'll be a mile away and you'll have my shoes, right? Oh, man. Like, Part of it's just amen, hallelujah, preach it, brother, we say when we read uh, quotes like that. Incredible. We just, we think we are so clever using Jesus' words the way we do. But what did Jesus actually say? We're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount. I want us to look at scripture this morning. Matthew chapter 7 is where we're at. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, for the reading of God's word. Matthew 7. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read this for us, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Here's what it says. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There it is. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Oh, man. Lord. (laughs) Uh, thank you. Thank you for these, your word uh, today. Thank you for these verses in your word. We, we, we need them. They're hard to listen to, though, Lord. We, we kind of feel like a bunch of bo- uh, kids who just got spanked, right? Uh, but your timing is amazing because there's a whole bunch of sinners here today who need a spanking. And that, that's me too, Lord, me too. But Lord, more than a spanking from your word, we We want discipline from you as a father who loves us as your kids. So bring, yes, bring correction to our lives today, but also show us your heart for us as your children and your heart for the people of this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, please, you may be seated. Yes. Okay. Um, Judgment. Judging others. Here's what's so crazy to me. Here's what's so crazy to me. If we're honest, and we're not, but if we were honest, we would probably say how we love to judge people, and we do it like all the time. Judging people is one of our favorite pastimes. It absolutely is. Now, we don't like it when other people judge us, but we love to judge other people. Have you ever felt judged by someone else? Yeah, you you have. You, you've been judged even when you didn't know you were getting judged. Have you ever felt unfairly judged by someone else? I, I, remember, I, remember, I remember a time that I got, I think, I think unfairly judged by somebody. So back in college, uh, there was this girl who became a friend of mine, not a girlfriend, just a friend of mine. Um, and before, before we kind of knew each other, before she became a friend of mine, she... Uh, she didn't have the same thoughts as me of me as she did after she got to know me. In fact, she told me when we were friends, she said, Dave, oh man, when I, first, when I first saw you, before I even knew you, I just thought you were such a jerk. I'm like, wait, what? Why? Like, why? What did I, what did I do? What did I, what did I say? She said, oh, no, she said, I just, yeah, I just thought you were so cocky. I'm like, you thought I was cocky? Like, why? Like, 
did, did you hear me say something? Like, did I say something to you? She said, no, 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 no. I, no, 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 I never heard you say anything. Well, did you overhear me say something to somebody else? No, I never heard you over, overheard you saying anything to anybody else. Well, did I do something to you or to somebody? No, no, no. Had you even met me? No, I hadn't even met you. So why in the world did you think I was a jerk? Why did you think I was cocky? And this is what she said. Because of the way you walk. And I'm like, because of the way I walk? Because of the way I walk. I don't even, I'm like, I remember thinking, I don't know how to walk any other way than the way I walk. And what is that? Like, what, is, what does that even mean? Like, how do, I, how do I walk? That's cocky. The only other comment I've ever gotten on my walking has been from my mother, who says, David, you walk just like my father. She says, when I see you walking away, he had a bald head just like me. She says, when I see you walking away, when I don't see your face, I see you walking away, I go, there goes dad, there goes Hartvig, there he is, that's it. But like, oh my goodness, I felt so unfairly judged. Have you ever had something like that? But now there are some judgments, just, just, let's just take a minute. There are some judgments that are like absolutely, you know, deserving. For example, I mean, just, you guys can all check out for a minute, those of you online and everybody, Bethel Battle Lake, can I just talk to you for a minute, Bethel Battle Lake? Have you seen Pastor Nick today? Did you see him? Did you see what he's wearing? Oh my goodness. Like seriously? You're like, well, how, do you, how did you say? Well, yeah, we put a nanny cam in his office just to make sure he shows up for work on Sundays. So I know he's there, but did you see what he's wearing? Like, oh my goodness. Who, who in the world is he thinking? He's got this like pinkish kind of salmon-y color shirt with khaki pants and hey dude shoes. Like who, who does that? Right? Like where does he think he is? Like Key West or something? Come on, Pastor Nick. Hello. But I was thinking about it. You know what? I think I know what the problem is. You know what he just needs? He just needs more of Jesus. I think we should all pray for him. We should pray for Pastor Nick, call the fashion police, and, and pray for Pastor Nick at the same time. This is what we should do. Okay. All right. There it is. Right? Do you ever feel judged? And you're like, that's not fair. Love you, Pastor Nick. Love you, man. By the way, if you're visiting Bethel Battle Lake today, welcome to the circus. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Hope you come back next week. Um, but this is the way it is. It is so unfair sometimes, the way we judge people. Um, but how does this actually work? And what was Jesus getting to? Because judgment is part of life. It's just what we do. There are some judgments that are good and appropriate and necessary. So what Jesus, listen church, what Jesus is not saying is you don't get to make any judgments. He's not saying you don't get to make any judgments. He's saying you don't get to pass judgment. Uh-huh. There it is. There it is. There's a big difference between making a judgment and passing judgment on someone. Uh, New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce explains it this way. He writes, judgment is an ambiguous work, uh, word. In Greek, as in English, it may mean exercising a proper discernment. Uh, or it may mean sitting in judgment on people or even condemning them. Okay, in other words, judgment can either mean to discern, to discern, keyword, between good and evil, between right and wrong, okay, which is something we should do, or it can mean to condemn. So discern or condemn. That it can mean either, and same in English, Greek and English, the, the same distinction can be made. Now, judgment as condemnation, passing judgment, is what Jesus is prohibiting here in this text. This is what he is against. And this is incredibly important in the context, what he's saying here. Because first century Israel, I mean, they, their whole system, they had created a culture that was predicated on the notion that some people were acceptable and some people were not. Okay? They constructed this elaborate social hierarchy to determine who's in and who's out who gets to worship God and who doesn't get to worship God. This is what they created. They said, for example, Jews, Jews, good. Jews can worship God. Gentiles, non-Jews, no good. You don't get to worship God. They, they view Gentiles as dogs, like subhuman, not even human. They saw the wealthy, the rich, as, uh, as blessed and the, and the poor as cursed. The healthy people are the righteous people, but, but the sick people, the, the diseased, the disabled are judged as hopeless, helpless sinners in the sight of God. 
See, this is what was going on. So Jesus says, no to that kind of passing judgment. Be discerning, but no condemnation. That's the key. We don't get to pass judgment. Condemnation, no. We need to make judgment. Discernment, yes. Yes to discernment. So here's what I want us to do now. I want us to try this out right here in church. I want to see if we can make some judgments without passing judgments. You think we can do it? Can I just tell you something? The world outside doesn't think it's possible. The world outside says it's impossible. Those church people, they're just so judgy. They cannot make judgments without passing judgments. I, I say no, yes, absolutely we can. In fact, we absolutely, we absolutely must. Let, let's, try it out for, let's try it out here for today. For example, your Christian friend often lies to get out of things. Is that right or wrong? It's wrong, right? It's, it's wrong. It's, ab- it's absolutely wrong. Okay, good. That's, the, that's your warm-up. Here's two more. Your, your Christian friend treats his wife and children really badly. He demeans them. He ridicules them. He embarrasses them. He treats them poorly. Is that right or is that wrong? This is not a trick question. Okay, yeah, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Wrong. It's okay to make a judgment about that behavior. It's absolutely wrong. Uh, your Christian friend is sleeping with her boyfriend. Is this right or is this wrong? They're not married. Your Christian friend is sleeping with her boyfriend. Is it right or is it wrong? Again, not a trick question. It's, it's wrong. It's, it's wrong. Now, why, why is it wrong? Because I say it is? Because you think it is? Absolutely not. But because God's word tells us what's good and evil, what's right and wrong, and calls all of us to it. Not just your friend who's struggling with something. See? So it is fitting for us to make judgments about what is right and wrong. In fact, later on in this chapter, later on in chapter 7, Jesus makes judgments. He calls out good fruit and bad fruit. And it's not talking about fruit, by the way. It's code for behavior. He's saying there's some things that are wrong. And there are some things that are right. So Jesus isn't against making judgments. He's saying it's not fitting for you and I to then go beyond that and to pass judgment on people and to exclude them from the grace of God that we ourselves hope we get to have. See, that's where the problem comes in. Where we say you don't have access to the forgiveness and love and grace of God. I I do. And, And then we say like, you know, you shouldn't do that. You do it on purpose. That's really bad for us. It's like, well, I messed up. You know, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. So no, listen, make judgments, don't pass judgment. And Jesus gives us two reasons why. Here's the first. The first is even you don't want to be held to your own standards. Even you don't want to be held to your own standards. <laughs> it's crazy. It's so crazy. Okay, verse one and two. In fact, let's, let's look at it. Let's say this out loud together, church. Let's say it together. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Okay, well done. So I I think Jesus here is basically making an observation about the way things work in life. Specifically, that people will judge you by the standards you use to judge them. And that's bad news. That is not good news for us at all. Imposing our own personal standards will always come back to bite us. It absolutely will. I think this is why Jesus says later on in the same chapter, he says this, verse 12, so in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. Okay, the second reason is this. Your standards are not only not fair to others, but impossible for even you to live by. Not only do you not want to follow your standards and be held accountable to your own standards, but it's impossible for you to live by your own standards. He says this in verse three through five. Follow along as I read it. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, well, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. <laughs> you gotta love, you gotta love this. Like, church, 
you got to appreciate the vivid imagery that Jesus is using here. It is absolutely fantastic. It's actually cartoonish in scale, isn't it? Like, hey, hey, dude, <laughs> got a little something there in your eye. You know, you might want to you might want to you might want to deal with that. This is how crazy this is. This is absolutely how crazy. I, I brought I brought a prop. So t- this would be like me doing this, right? This would be like me uh, basically kind of going, all right, yeah, you know, like look at this. I got this kind of thing going on. I got this big old plane sticking in my eye. And while meanwhile, I got this going on. I'm looking at you. You got like a little stir stick or a toothpick in your eye, and I'm going, hey, dude. Not good. Like, I don't know if you saw that, but you should probably deal with that thing in your eye. It's just really bothering me. It's not really a good witness. And so I, you know, you might want to deal with that because you, dude, you, got, you got problems. Meanwhile, this thing is like coming out of my eye. Like, this is the way it is, right? This is what Jesus is talking about here in the text. He's like, do you have any clue? What is so amazing to me is how clearly I am able to see what's wrong with you but how blind I am to my own problems, to my own sin. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it like this. Judging others makes us blind. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. Yeah. Or I love this quote. This quote is great. John Mark Green writes, The self-righteous scream judgments against others to hide the noise of skeletons dancing in their own closets. (laughs) Listen, we struggle with this. We absolutely do. So the word of God speaks to us where we live. I love this from, from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 14 asks this question. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Okay. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Okay? Every one of us is going to have to give an account of ourselves to God. The reality is we don't have to do that to each other. So here's what I want us to do, just for a minute. Look at your neighbor. Find your neighbor sitting right next to you. Hopefully you got somebody next to you. If not, you know, shoot your eyes at somebody across the room maybe or something like that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to repeat after me. You're going to say two things. You ready? Here's the first. Say this after me. I'm so glad there's a judge. Say that. I'm so glad there's a judge. You got it? Okay. Now say this. And that it's not you. And that it's not you. Right? Amen? Amen? Amen. There's a judge. There is accountability. I'm not the judge. Neither are you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that we're not. Okay. So like I said, there's a, there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new John 3.16 that uh, is calling the shots in our culture today. But I, I, I think we need to go back to the old one. How about you? Anybody else think that? Like, I, I say we go back to the old one. I really think we need to. So here it is. I'm going to read John 3, 16, and, and for no extra charge, I'm going to throw in verse 17 and 18 here today, all right? Let's take a look at this. John 3, 16 through 18 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Church, there's one judge. It's God the Father. And there's one standard. It's Jesus the Son. And there are two choices. We can either try to be perfect like Jesus and take our chances with the judge? Or we can say yes to the offer, the free offer of forgiveness by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. 
Because, yeah, the Bible talks about judgment. In lots of different places, it talks about it. But we want to know something? The judgment that the Bible is really focused on is the judgment that centers on the judgment that came down from God the Father on Jesus, his son, for your sins and for mine. And for the sins of everybody out there that we like to point fingers at sometimes. See, this is it. The judgment that the Bible talks about, the one that it's focused on, is the judgment of Jesus Christ for your sins and for mine. And here's what happens when we get that. It makes us these kind of paradoxical Christians that the world simply does not know what to do with. Because we are, on the one hand, the kind of Christians who take an absolutely firm, immovable stand on what is right and wrong according to the word of God and not our opinion. Huh? Amen? We take a firm stand on what is right and wrong unapologetically, but we do so motivated by hearts that aren't quick to condemn others, but to love others. And if we could get that, If we could be the kind of Christians in our culture that say there is a right and there is a wrong, but do so with love in our hearts and that comes out of our lips in the way we talk about these things, the world will not know what to do with Christians like that. We don't point fingers of accusation. We point fingers that show the way to the cross. We say, I'm going that way. And you can come too. Let's be believers like that. Shall we? Let's pray. Lord, help us to be believers like that. Help us to be the kind of Christians who understand how much we have been forgiven. How much grace we have used up. And that there's still more is amazing for us. It doesn't mean that we have to be soft on what's right and wrong. No, no, no. But Lord, help us to, to be motivated by love with one another. There is a judge, and we're not it. We're not him. Help us, Lord Jesus, to just, yeah. Well, judgment should begin with the house of God. So we, we, we're called to walk in your way. Uh, help us to do that. We're, we want to be people obedient to your word and to go your way. But we'll, again, Lord Jesus, you're not just spanking us here this morning. You're, you're treating us like the children you love, showing us the right way to go. Help us, Lord. Help us and lead us. Lead us to the cross. Thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. So if you're here this morning and uh, that's good news for you, uh, I just want you to know that's, that's not only good news for you, but it's good news you get to give away. We're, we're fond of saying here at Bethel, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it, but there's something you can do with it. You can join what Jesus is up to in the lives of the people around you, and not only be a consumer of that love, but a conveyor of it to the people around you. Do that. And as you go, as you live for him, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God's peace be with you.